Welcome everyone to our, um, our virtual workshop of the TCI Cluster Evaluation Working Group. Um, for those of us who've been involved in the working group over the last seven years since we first, uh, first set it up um, through TCI, we've been all over the place, but I think this is a, an opportunity for us to talk to more people at the same time and get everyone's participation. So, you know, you never know, maybe we'll, we'll intersperse virtual workshops with physical workshops if, uh, if we find that this one, uh, this one works well. Before I kicked off, I just wanted to hand over to Moretta as, um, as TCI president, um, because uh, there will be some people um, uh, who are very, very active and well-versed with TCI, but there may be others who are, who are listening to this and signed into this who've not been engaged with TCI um, or the working groups before. So it's probably worth um, just um, saying hello from TCI. Moretta, do you want to, to say a few words? Yes, thank you, Madeline, and thank you for giving me a chance to promote the network a, a bit again. Um, yeah, and, and last year we spent quite a while making a, a new strategy for TCI network, and uh, it's for 2020 to 25, and right now this seems like <laughs> a long time ago, but what it still underlines is that uh, TCI is about uh, bringing in experts that work with clusters and innovation ecosystems, and it is about interacting and learning and inspiring each other. Um, so that's uh, that what the aim of TCI is, that we have members uh, from um, many countries. We have 500 active members uh, and almost 80 organizations, and we reach out to 111 countries. So we are indeed a global network, and it's really great to see this global coverage also for, for this workshop. Um, and the, what we focus on is about, a lot about policy learning so, um, and, and building the global connections around that and also for inspiring uh, clusters on taking um, on new ways and new ways of, of working. So thank you, Madeline, and also Emily and James that put forward so much energy in this, uh, in this uh, both in, in the cluster evaluation working group and also in, in hosting and, and monitoring and all you've done over the years. It's been amazing for, for us as a network. Um, uh, so I, I'm really happy for the numbers here. It's really great that we attracted also people that don't know TCI so much. And I know you have a great program ahead of us. So for the ones not knowing TCI so much, you're in for a treat, I'm sure. <laughs> so re relax and enjoy and also be very active and, and join the chat as much, much as you want. Thank you. Thank you, Marika. Good. Okay. Well, I think without further ado, we should uh, um, get on with the session. And of, here we go. I thought for a moment my screen had frozen just right at the beginning, but it hasn't, so that's okay. Um, uh, I think, first of all, I think one, one of the things we're going to do this afternoon, we've got a couple of hours and we've got a lot to fit in, because um, as well as just saying hello and, uh, and um, giving a bit of an introduction to TCI, um, we want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in the TCI evaluation working group. It's one of the working groups within TCI where we focus on cluster evaluation. I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff we've been doing over the, over the last few years and where you can find more information about what we've been doing. Um, this particular um, working group session, initially we were meant to be in Milan. Today we were meant to be in, in Milan, um, but global events have, uh, have overtaken us, but that's never stopped us uh, working in a collaborative way in TCI before, so we were determined that we were going to continue to have the working group session and look at some of the stuff that we had um, focused on for that session about looking how can we evidence the wider impact of clusters. Um, so we've got um, uh, four great speakers. Actually, I think three are going to be speaking and uh, um, um, Fernando, you're going to be chipping in if, uh, if, if you uh, um, have some additional things you want to add. Um, but we've got speakers from Sweden, from, from Catalonia, from, um, from Northern Italy being, uh, um, being representing the, the, the Milan uh, uh, contingent. Um, what we've asked those speakers to talk about are those three questions that you see in the, in the blue box. But we also sent them out to anyone who signed up for the, for the workshop. So um, 
uh, we've also got a big response from that survey. So as well as hearing from the speakers, we're also wanting to, to share the responses that uh, we've gathered from that survey from all the different participants. We got over, over 50, I think, um, uh, responses, well over 50 responses um, that, came, uh, that came back for that survey. So it's great that we can also share those responses. And James is gonna be helping me to, uh, to collate that um, as we try and share experiences. Um, there's a couple of uh, rules and requests. Um, we're keen to, to see if there are any other additional questions that are, um, that are prompted through the presentations and through the discussions. But obviously it's very, very difficult. We've got, um, we've got over 100 people now on this call or, or just about 100 people on this call and, we, and we've got um, more who are ex potentially joining over the next, uh, next couple of hours. So what we ask is if you can ask any questions through the chat function, then once again, um, James is gonna help me to, to sift through those, those questions at the end of each um, section so that we can get a little bit of input to our panelists. Um, uh, obviously we'll be um, presenting and, uh, um, uh, and the questions will be shared um, as, uh, as always through the TCI website so that we can, you can share this with, uh, with other people who couldn't make it today. Um, and we will be recording the session so that we can share it more widely as well. I would ask um, if you haven't already that you, you mute your microphone when you're not speaking um, so that we are able just to hear the, the presenters speaking. Okay, then just to, to talk a little bit about the cluster evaluation working group uh, and the story so far. So what we found in TCI is that um, quite a few of us were all grappling with the same challenge. That cluster evaluation is, is quite challenging um, to, to explore um, because it is quite complex. Um, however, it's a really, really important aspect as more and more investment goes into, into that area. So what we're trying to do is we're working together as ever in TCI to work collaboratively to share that learning to identify gaps in what we know about cluster evaluation and try to work together to develop new approaches. And it, as I said, we found it was a shared challenge. There was quite a few of us that even though there's a lot of cluster initiatives around the globe these days, um, we found there was a shortage of evaluation research and practice um, that uh, uh, we were all trying to find the best way to evaluate our clusters, but we didn't have um, a, common, um, a common way of doing it. Um, and that's a challenge because it, it, it then leads cluster policies open to, to questions. And evaluation should always be about learning and informing what we do next. So we were missing that opportunity to learn and improve if we couldn't tackle evaluation in the right way. So we were really keen to fill that gap. Um, and when we started talking about it, we were thinking, well, actually, it's really quite uh, difficult to measure the impacts of working in clusters because uh, very often it's the longer term where you finally see the benefit. Um, and it's all about bringing together collaborations, building trust and social capital. And that's quite intangible to, to measure. It's quite a challenge to measure. And there's lots of spillover into other other areas beyond the cluster initiative. Um, and there are other policies which are dealing in this, with the same um, group of, of firms and organizations. And also that clusters aren't all the same. You have to build it on the strengths and the opportunities and the needs of your, of your local region and context. And so therefore it's quite difficult to have a, a standard approach to evaluation. So all of those things were some of the challenges that we uncovered. So we decided to work together to look at um, how could we develop better approaches to, to tackle this particular challenge. It's worth just thinking about why it is a challenge around cluster evaluation. Very often in evaluation, we pull together um, a, a logic model and say what we do is we put, um, we have a policy and we put some investment in one end, we fund the cluster initiative, that's going to change the behaviours uh, much more collaborative, doing things together to innovate, to internationalization, internationalize, that improves the competitiveness and that has an impact on the region, which sounds great um, in theory, but it's not that simple. 
there are external factors around the way the, the cluster and the firms and the organizations in the cluster operate. What's, what's then their experience of collaborating? Um, how much trust is already built and are you building on that strength or are you starting from, from scratch? So those external factors around the sector are um, also uh, an issue, but also the external factor about what's happening in your region. Um, and if we ever wanted to um, remind ourselves about the importance of factoring in the external factors, then the situation we are in at the moment, I think, has really brought that to, to bear. I don't think any of us could envisage the external factors we're now having to deal with, so how this is going to have an impact on, on what clusters are able to do. We need to build those kind of things into evaluation. Also, though, it, as I say, there are other policies, there are skills development, there are internationalization, there are research and development um, and infrastructure policies that are having an impact. So how do you factor in these other, these other elements, this multi-level policy mix, the fact that it's all about the intangible human elements and also very often has a time lag. So all of these aspects meant that it's not a simple linear logic model. It's much more, um, it's much more complex than that. And so we set up the cluster evaluation working group to try and work together on this. We met for the first time in Scotland um, in 2013. Um, and we've been meeting ever since um, over the last seven years. And I'm going to have to get a bigger slide now because um, any more meetings and I won't be able to fit it in. But we've met every year and had a particular working group workshop and we've also had a session at every TCI annual global conference. Um, and as you can see, we've got our final one here is our virtual workshop. Um, so uh, this, this kind of collaborative activity will continue. We've had some key outputs. It's worth looking at what we've generated. We've tried to capture some of that in the TCI um, uh, evaluation part of the, of the website. So we've, we've done some outputs around a perfect evaluation framework. How can, you, how can you look at how a cluster might grow over time and what you would be looking at? Some principles to guide cluster evaluation. Um, and we also, as part of the human element aspect, have developed some firm level survey questions that can be included within an evaluation. And those have been used on a, on a few evaluations now around, around the globe with different partners. We've also had some more um, uh, tangible outputs. Uh, we had a poster and a paper at the OECD Blue Sky Forum a couple of years ago. We've done a number of conference presentations at the Triple Helix Conference, the um, uh, um, Regional Studies Association Conference. We've done some evaluation cases about training and developing in, in, in all sorts of different areas who are trying to learn and implement cluster policies. Um, and hot off the press, we actually have captured some of, our, of the work we've been doing over the last seven years um, in uh, the journal article that has just very recently been, been published in Regional Science Policy and Practice, looking at the work that the, that's based around the work of the TCI Cluster Evaluation Working Group. So please do go and, go and uh, uh, look those out and, uh, and find the outputs that we've generated so far. When we first set off, we, one of the things we asked is what are the key questions we need to focus on? And the first three was uh, around developing and sharing good practice uh, and techniques for cluster evaluation, looking at the human element, but also how do we evidence and communicate the critical success factors? And so many of the activities, we're still addressing those questions. In more recent times, we've broadened it as well. Um, to look at um, measurement and evaluation of clusters in relation to smart specialization strategies. An awful lot of uh, regions are, are trying to see how the alignment of cluster policy and S3 um, uh, strategies are actually, ca can we use measurement and evaluation to feed across both? We've had um, increasing conversations about cluster evaluation beyond GDP. What are the other aspects, the wider value where clusters uh, contribute? Um, and we've also started to look at what are the different levels where you might see some effects at a, a, is it at the project level, is it the organization level, the policy or program level, or at this wider system level? And where would you see those effects? Are they with the cluster actors, um, the, the, the cluster initiative itself, or that system level? And try to say, well, if we can break down those aspects in the different levels, 
maybe we can put in place some, some tangible evaluation measures. So just to very quickly touch on those, because we've talked about those in quite a few uh, um, details over the last couple of uh, working group sessions, we're also aware that some of those effects are quite short term and you see them almost immediately and some of those effects are quite longer term. Unfortunately, too often we ask our clusters to give us economic performance data immediately. But in actual fact, that's maybe a, a longer term aspect and should we be looking for effects in a slightly different way in some of those earlier, earlier um, years. The area I wanted to focus really on was the territorial system level where we know, we know increasingly clusters are being asked to look in uh, and contribute at that level. Um, but did we really understand the kind of things that you would see, the kind of effects that you would start to see um, uh, if you're contributing in those uh, in, in, at the system level? And in preparation for this working group, we started to unpick a bit, unpick it a bit about what do we really mean about our scope of influence in a, in a system level? So obviously there are um, clusters, uh, cluster activity and cluster projects, and we have a direct effect in those. And very often that's the focus of our evaluation. But there will be spillover effects, immediate spillover effects into the wider, um, uh, the wider sector or into um, those that benefit, they may not be cluster initiative members, but they are still benefited from the skills, from the, um, from the knowledge that's being generated, for example. So those are the sort of immediate spillover effects. Increasingly as well, though, clusters are being asked to act in this strategic leadership role. So they, they, because you have a cluster, that can act as a catalyst for other activities, other, attract other um, investments into that area because of the strength of the cluster. Or the cluster can be, be, can be the go-to organization to find out what's happening in that industry in that region and can act as the voice of the industry of the sector in that region. So they tend to be the go-to, uh, in you know, some ways quietly spoken, but influential strategic leadership um, voice uh, in the region. And more and more so, actually, um, as part of measurement, uh, particularly from funders at a territorial policy level, um, the question is being asked about, well, what are, what, in what other ways are you contributing to our region, uh, contributing to our territory? Are you contributing um, around environmental or around diversity or around social cohesion? So what are the other ways that where um, clusters are, are contributing? And as you go away from the, uh, the direct um, projects, it gets quite difficult to show the causality of the role of the cluster, but it doesn't mean to say it's not a, a really important thing to start try and capture because that gives a wider evidence of the value of the cluster in the region. So when we started looking at this then at the, at the system level, we're starting to see some of the areas around spillover effects and around strategic leadership effects probably you'll see them more tangibly in the longer term but you will see some early signs earlier on so we need to find ways to start to measure those systemic effects and indeed about the the wider effects um, uh, uh, beyond economic in some of these higher level effects as well so that really was the focus of what we shaped this session to look at and what we've asked our presenters to focus in in their responses and indeed that, uh, that you guys all, all responded to as part of the survey. Um, this whole area around what are the different ways where we can evidence the wider impact of clusters in the system. So as I say we've got three speakers who are on your screens in front of you um, for those who are, have, got a, have got a gallery view. Um, so we've got Emily Wise from, uh, from Lund in Sweden um, we have Juan Marti from, uh, from Catalonia um, and we have Federica Balfanti um, from, uh, from the Lombardy region as well as Fernando um, uh, who's going to jump in if, uh, if there are additional things to answer. Um, as I say, we've also asked those questions through the survey um, and we've done some analysis of um, some of those survey responses. So we've got some initial responses as well to the same questions. 
Um, and please do ask any questions through the chat function. And um, James Wilson is going to be uh, um, helping to, to, to make sure we don't miss any of those questions and capture all those questions. Um, and at the end of each um, section, we'll just have a look and see if there are any questions that, uh, that we need to respond to. Okay. I think without, that's enough of me talking, certainly. And, uh, and um, I'm going to move on to, uh, to all our participants and start with that first question. A little bit of introduction, if you wouldn't mind. But then looking at what are the strategic frameworks um, that help drive those more than economic contributions from clusters in your region? Emily. Great. Thanks, Madeline. Thanks for the introduction to the working group and to this topic. And uh, I'm Emily Watts. I am a researcher as well as an independent consultant working in the south of Sweden. And I've been since 2003 following Wienvext, the program at Vinova's comp comparable cluster program in Sweden, which has existed itself since 2002. Um, and I've been working with Vinova in various roles over that period of time since 2003. And most recently, I'm conducting a research project looking particularly at system level results in the Vinvext cluster initiatives. You can take the next slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Thanks, Madeline. Yeah, so the Vinvex program is, um, it's promoting sustainable regional growth by developing internationally competitive research and innovation environments in different growth fields. The VeenVex program is unique in a number of ways. Uh, one is that it is a very long-term uh, program. It has 10-year funding of these environments, 10 years plus funding. There are some uh, VeenVex initiatives that have gotten kind of a transition funding after the initial 10-year period. It's unique also in that it focuses on the system level. Renewal, the collaborative group of actors from government, from academia, and from industry. It's led by industry, but it's very important that all of these sectors are part of the collaborative initiative. Um, and it's unique in that it focuses on renewal and transformation of the innovation system as such. So it's not only uh, looking at industrial competitiveness, but it's also looking at this renewal of the regional innovation system in these specific growth fields. Um, the Wienvex portfolio, it's a portfolio of initiatives that have come into the program at different periods of time. So these initiatives that you see listed here, some of them have uh, in fact graduated from the program, um, but they're still a part of Sweden's an important part of Sweden's innovation system, and they serve as um, innovation hubs or innovation nodes in Sweden, and they're profiled on uh, iHubs Sweden. It's a separate uh, website, but basically they're they're an innovation hub for life. These these Vindex initiatives. Next slide, please. Um, and when talking about kind of the strategic frameworks that the Vindex program relates to, it's always been related to regional innovation systems and regional innovation strongholds. So in effect, it related to smart specialization strategies before they existed as a concept in Europe. Um, so for sure, it uh, relates to the regional smart specialization strategies as all each of these initiatives has to be a well anchored stronghold within the regional system and a kind of a prioritized area of expertise and an area where the region itself wants to transform and upgrade and renew this system. In addition, the Vinvex program, as most programs at Vinova, or if not all programs at Vinova, they relate to the Agenda 2030 sustainable, the global sustainable development goals. And in fact, the latest. Uh, Vinvex call in 2017, I believe it was launched, or 2018. It was one of the, the, the strategic frames that the applying initiatives had to relate to and explain how they were going to contribute to realizing different of the sustainable development goals. 
And then I, I want to point out as well that uh, kind of the effect logic for the VeenBex program uh, highlights a number of eff expected effects on the, the business actor level, on the research actor level, on the public sector actor level. And also uh, kind of the first one that's listed is effective regional innovation systems that are capable of you know, driving innovation and transformation. Next slide, please. But as Madeline was introducing at the start of this workshop is that it's extremely difficult to kind of track these system level transformations. Um, Beambex has been doing this in their annual reporting by tracking uh, important events and that each initiative is driving in their respective systems. Um, it's layer four of the, the picture to the left. Um, but it's it's being hard it's been hard to find a common language and a common way of describing these transformational changes so building on the reporting practices that have existed in VeenVex over a number of years as well as the cluster program framework of effects within tci and um, the research project that i've been working on together with the VeenVex initiatives and the program leads as well as the action researchers that work within each initiative is uh, to try to structure this up and, and develop a common language, a kind of definition of in different categories, ways of understanding the system level, uh, a really important com what contribution that Beanbex initiatives play and contribute, as well as a structured approach, like what, what reporting methods or what ways do we go about uh, evidencing this system level change? Um, and particular ideas and tips of how one might use this information. Once it's collected and reporting, it's not supposed to end there, but how do you use this information to drive continual change over time since in these long-term initiatives? So that's what we will be talking more about in the next section. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Emily. That's a, a good introduction to how the VINVEX program is, is looking beyond just the, the cluster initiative, but also their, their, their key role in the wider innovation system. Um, Joanne Marti from, uh, from Catalonia, um, would you like to just talk a little bit about um, how, how Catalonia and your clusters have been, uh, have been driven to look beyond economic measures? Sure. Thank you very much, Madeline. Thank you for putting a picture from when I was much younger. Uh, I'm John Marti. I'm director of clusters at the Catalonia Agency for Competitiveness. Always happy to share our views in TCI. Happy to be here today talking about our framework, which is related to shared value. So here you have our cluster portfolio. Uh, we develop our cluster policy through a specific uh, cluster program, which is called Catalonia Clusters. And now we have 29 cluster organizations with more than 2,600 uh, companies involved, generating more or less the 30% of the Catalan GDP. Uh, just a figure that you can have uh, an idea of, of what's the Catalan GDP. We have the same GDP as Israel. So 30% of this GDP is participating in, in our cluster portfolio. Related to share value, we believe that all these clusters have the potential to generate share value. Some of those, because share value is in their DNA, for instance, the water cluster or the bioenergy cluster, but some others don't have share value, maybe at the core of, of their businesses, but we believe they, they also have potential, let's say media or packaging, for instance. So in here you see a picture of a, you know different media that lately have been talking about the concept of purpose. You know that share value was going in 2011. We didn't uh, use the share value concept at, at 2011. We have to be sincere. We, we started four years ago, more or less. But today, I don't think that share value is a trending topic, you know, concept. But I think that purpose, it, it is really a, a concept that everybody is using. If you have a look at, at the last meeting in Davos, they were talking about purpose. If you have a look at the front cover of the economies from last August, it was about purpose. There has been these 20,000 students in France 
you know, saying that they are never going to work for companies that are polluting the environment. So I think there are a lot of, you know, inputs from the environment that show us that society must be at the center of businesses and not just shareholders. So from all the different concepts that, that are uh, out there, I, I, we believe in, in shared value because it's a holistic concept. So we all talk about other concepts like circular economy, but they think that shared value is more holistic, not just speaking about environmental issues, but also about social issues and so on. So related to our approach for clusters, we have two main objectives since the very start of our cluster policy back in 1992. The first of all, we want clusters to be a tool to help companies sophisticate in their strategy. So for us, clusters are a school of strategy. And second, we want clusters to improve the competitive environment of a certain business. Shared value is connected to both of those objectives. To the first one, because shared value, it adds a social dimension to strategy. And the second one, because if shared value improves society, it's indeed improving the competitive environment of our companies. So shared value, again, at the core of both strategic objectives of cluster development in Catalonia. We have a plan and our specific plan to create the shared value approach uh, started with five pilot projects in five different clusters, the one that you can see here water packaging, fashion, kids clusters, and energy efficient. And the main objective of those pilot projects was to develop a original and a specific methodology to generate shared value in companies. Now we have this specific methodology. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it later on. Indeed, we have incentives. Uh, not, not yet, Madeline, sorry. If you can, yeah. Indeed, we have incentives. So uh, our, you know, funds for clusters, are going to prioritize the projects with a shared value component. So money indeed is, is an important part of the game and, and we're going to put more money in shared value projects. Indeed, we're going to deliver a specialized training for our cluster managers. Actually, three years ago, we did a training with James, who is in the picture. And we're going to repeat this training again, actually next week. With, with a company which uh, specialized in B Corp, which is the last thing I want to mention in this introduction. And indeed, dissemination is really important. Our next cluster day is going to be held around the concept of shared value. So money, methodology, dissemination, training. And just the last thing uh, in this introduction, uh, we believe that the B Corp movement is really well connected to shared value. So we didn't want to create a new set of metrics if there is one set of metrics that is useful. I don't know if you know about the B Corp movement. It was launched in New York several years ago. Today, there are some companies, some thousands of companies using this methodology. Actually, you can have a certification or you can just use the methodology because it's free in the internet. And we believe that it's really interesting. And even though they don't speak about shared value, for us, it's the same concept. So the, the B Corp, uh, you know, methodology basically works in five components, which are environment, workers, customers, community and governance. And firms have to demonstrate that they are doing well in all those five components. So this is the uh, methodology in terms of firms that we're using. Later on, I'm going to talk about the specific metrics for shared value in, at the cluster level. Thanks, John. Um, look forward to hearing that. Those, those B Corp measures, you're right, actually fit quite well with some of those broader, higher level values that, um, that we've been discussing as a cluster system level impact. So interesting to unpick those. Federica, would you like to just talk a little bit about um, the wider impact of cluster activities in your region? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Madeline, for inviting us. Uh, actually, we have a quite nice weather here in Milano, so it will have been a great workshop, I think, but <laughs> next time. Um, Yes, we, we have been studying uh, uh, shared value, me and um, Fernando Alberti at the Institute for Entrepreneurship and Competence uh, at Liuk University in uh, north of Italy uh, for five years, uh, four or five years now. And we are studying uh, shared value with special reference uh, 
uh, in relation with uh, clusters, because uh, we were uh, already studying clusters very much. The Institute was one of our uh, main research area. I also personally work in a, in a cluster organizations for two, uh, for two years. In, in one of the two clusters that I'm uh, going to talk about today, uh, actually. Um, and, and the idea of a share value, the topic of share value immediately fascinated us, uh, not just for its uh, potential as a new, uh, strong, uh, sustainable development uh, uh, strategy, but also because when um, Professor Porter and Mark Kramer introduced the theory in 2011, uh, uh, they, for the first time, made this explicit connection and reference to clusters in their, your, in their your seminal paper. So it was something that immediately uh, gained our attention. Um, so as we know, um, Porter and Kramer said that firms can create shared value, so can uh, create uh, business uh, and social uh, uh, progress at the same time uh, in three main ways. Uh, so firms can uh, create shared value by reconceiving products and markets, can create shared value by uh, redefining uh, their productivity along the value chain uh, in many different ways, but they can also create share value by enabling uh, the uh, creation and the development of uh, uh, local clusters. Um, slide, please. Madeline? Thank you. And so in the last year, we uh, uh, especially focus on one specific topic uh, in the field of shared value and is the, the measurement of shared value. So that's why we are, I think we are here today uh, with you. Um, we started from this uh, framework, that is the framework uh, uh, that has been introduced by uh, Professor Porter and some of his colleagues uh, of uh, FSG, is a consulting firm, in uh, 2011. Um, based on their uh, experience uh, with many, many firms uh, introducing uh, shared value strategies. Um, and they uh, created this uh, framework to uh, give firms a practical tool, so to give firms a way uh, to uh, measure, to keep track, and to give evidence uh, of the results that they, uh, they achieve. Because uh, uh, as, they say, as they said, uh, um, if you don't measure what you're achieving, uh, it's highly probable that you will miss also many, many opportunities uh, for growth and for innovation and for um, creating social impact at scale. So it's really important. And, and they introduced this framework actually as a, uh, even a, a way itself for unlocking uh, uh, new and additional value for, for firms and for the society as well. Um, so they introduced this framework. As you can see here, they identified and suggested some of the uh, key indicators and metrics that you can use uh, at each level uh, of share value in order to measure the results you achieved. Um, and as I said, we, we decided to uh, specifically focus uh, on the, the further uh, level of this framework. We started from this framework at slide, please. Uh, to try to actually answer to a uh, very simple but important, I think, uh, question when it comes to shared value and clusters. And the question was, do clusters create shared value? So we, we know that we have many, uh, already many contributions in literature, in real life. We have many case studies of firms and clusters uh, launching and introducing these kind of strategies. Uh, but we, we, we want to start from, from this, uh, from uh, trying to, to demonstrate that clusters actually create shared value huh? as, a, as a starting point for our, for our research. And so we, uh, we decided to study one specific cluster that I think is one of the most successful and fascinating cluster uh, in Italy, that is the Motor Valley uh, cluster. It's the place uh, where some of the uh, most world famous um, uh, sports car uh, companies uh, were born, like uh, Ferrari, Maserati, Ducati, Lamborghini, and, and some of the big names like Enzo Ferrari or Valentino Rossi were born. So uh, I think we can say that it, it's really a successful cluster. Uh, in, in the last years, they uh, launched a new program in order to uh, rethink completely the touristic offer, uh, the touristic strategy of the region. Uh, in order to uh, leverage even more on this uh, fantastic uh, heritage uh, that they have in, in uh, automotive and, uh, and motorsports industries. Um, so we started from, uh, from, the from this cluster and from the framework introduced by uh, Michael Porter and colleagues, uh, and we decided to, to test uh, this relationship. So if uh, by developing a cluster, you really can create uh, uh, business and social results for the firms and for the society 
uh, at large. Uh, we identified uh, what literature and, and I think real life consider the main key driver for cluster uh, development. Uh, because uh, as we all know, I think we can, um, uh, we can say that one of the key driver for cluster development is the, uh, for example, the increase uh, in the uh, creation of social capital and of trust among its members. Uh, but we can also know that one of the main key drivers is an increase in the exchange of uh, knowledge and on communication among its members and an exchange, uh, an increase in the exchange uh, also of uh, physical goods. Uh, so you know, of uh, services, technologies and economic transactions in general. Um, so we decided to uh, try to understand, uh, thanks to a model that we developed and uh, social network analysis and methodology, um, if by developing a cluster, you can also create this kind of, uh, uh, of results and of impact. And we um, measure share value by picking uh, the most suitable measures for uh, indicators for measuring share value in the Motor Valley cluster in, uh, in Emilia Romagna. So we pick the, some of the indicators that Potter suggested in his uh, framework. Uh, we pick a profitability and workforce growth uh, for business results. And for social results, uh, um, considering the touristic nature of the cluster, we consider visitors growth in the last years. Uh, but it's also a knowledge intensive cluster and industry in general. So uh, we decided to try to measure also the uh, education improvement um, uh, reaching this, uh, in this year. Um, so actually we, uh, we tested the model and we had uh, uh, super positive results. So we had a, a significant and strong correlation between uh, these, um, the, the variables of cluster developing and the variables of uh, shared value creation. Um, so this was uh, just the, the starting point for our research and we decided, uh, thanks to this, uh, encouraged by these uh, positive results uh, to uh, try to apply this model in some of the uh, Italian best practices when it comes to cluster development and cluster strategies. Uh, so today, uh, slide please, uh, we are going to present the uh, Wellness Valley case, another I think super fascinating cluster in Italy. It's the cluster launched by um, Nerio Alessandri and the Technogym. Uh, a visionary entrepreneur, uh, I think. They launched this initiative in 2002 in order to create uh, the first wellness cluster in the world with the aim of enhancing uh, people's quality of, uh, of life and well-being, uh, while at the same time, uh, obviously support also the sustainable growth uh, of uh, local society and businesses. Uh, they have now an ecosystem of um, um, 250 public and private stakeholders actively involved in their initiative. And I think uh, it's really a, a successful example of, of cluster initiative. The other one is the Lombardia Aerospace Cluster uh, that has been launched in 2009 in, in our region, in Lombardia. Uh, it's now uh, formally recognized by Lombardy region together with other eight uh, technological clusters. Uh, today it involves 95 uh, actors, uh, always among uh, firms uh, and uh, uh, universities, R&D centers uh, and so on. Um, it's the only aerospace cluster in Italy with uh, three complete supply chains because they involve the fixed wing, the rotary wing, but also the space supply chain. Um, and they in particular aim at giving a, a unique, uh, um, visible and a united voice uh, to, the, um, to the aerospace uh, regional system uh, and so be the, the interface with the institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. I look forward to hearing about the, um, what you found within those, those two very different clusters um, as we go uh, uh, through the presentation. Um, I'd, I'd just like to bring in James actually now to, to help us talk through some of the responses we got from the same questions um, in the survey around what the strategic frameworks were that, that, that drove those more than economic contributions from clusters. 
Thanks, Madeline. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I, I think there we've um, uh, we've picked through those three presentations. We started with in Emily's presentation, hearing about uh, smart specialization um, and the sustainable development goals as kind of two key strategic frameworks that are central to the VINVAC strategy. And then we've had two more detailed examples uh, from Joanne and uh, from Federico around the use of the shared value concept, both kind of in a more academic sense in terms of trying to measure, and then also in a, in a practical sense, the way in Catalonia they're using that concept to uh, as a strategic framework to guide their policy. Uh, it was interesting to compare that with uh, with the survey that we did beforehand. Uh, we had just over 50 responses to the survey and I suspect that given the answers they may be rather European centric because uh, around 70% of responses noted that smart specialization strategies was the um, was the kind of core framework that they use to link clusters to wider systemic impacts, which uh, I, I found very uh, an interesting result that the, that the percentage was so high. I expected it actually to be slightly more distributed across the different frameworks. But I, again, I think perhaps it's a, it's a European centric focus, but it also demonstrates the influence that smart specialization strategies have had around clusters and cluster policy over the last, uh, over the last five or 10 years since they started to become very, very prominent. Um, we see their sustainable development goals just under 50%. So that was obviously clearly in the minds of many of many of you in terms of uh, in terms of strategic framework. And I wonder if that's on the rise, if that's something that uh, that we'll see gaining more traction in, in, in coming years. And shared value also very well represented, uh, but, but perhaps not quite as much as the others. Just picking up through some of the questions, um, there were a few specific questions which have already been answered in the chat uh, backwards and forwards. But there was uh, there was one question um, from Takalani, which relates, I think, to these strategic frameworks. And she asked whether um, uh, whether these, uh, with how, how this relates to industrial policy, another strategic framework that we use very commonly to understand uh, economic development policy, and perhaps that's something just to throw back to the uh, to the presenters. I don't know if you want to do that now, Madeline, or, or, or at the end, but uh, perhaps another another strategic framework we might want to consider is industrial policy and how that links across these uh, across the ones that we've picked out here. I think that's a very good question because uh, industrial policy would be another thing that would be driving some of the um, uh, uh, some of the investments and some of the the ways we frame our more than economic uh, responses within cluster policy. Do any of the panelists want to come back immediately on that? I'll quickly say that the um, Pinova, which is Sweden's innovation agency, is is it, it's part of a, it's an agency under the the Ministry of Industry. But the, the programs, including Vinvex, are mostly in relation to innovation policy, which is some kind of combination between industrial policy and research policy it, in, in a very non-academic way of, <laughs> of framing it. So it definitely relates to innovation policy and I would say to a lesser extent traditional industrial policy. You know what? Sorry. Do you want me to? Yeah. Okay, go on, John. Go on. In our case, the competitiveness agency belongs to the Department of Industry. Uh, so I think that there is a great connection between industrial policy and cluster policy, at least in, in our case. And actually, later on, I'm going to speak about the connection between, between policies. But from the very beginning, uh, I think that the cluster policy was a uh, a part of the industrial policy in, in our country and, and, and still is because we have this objective that, you know, manufacturing is becoming more, more and more important. What has changed is the definition of industry. Mm -hmm. Now we speak about manufacturing plus services related to industry, but I think that the connection is, is really there. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to move between several screens and I kept moving the, the presentation on and I hadn't realized, so I do apologize for that. I think um, we've, got, we've got a few questions coming through the chat, I see, but I'm e equally aware that we've got quite a few questions to get through in the actual presentation. So I'm just going to move on to the, the second question um, about those different types of contribution to the broader system level improvements that clusters are making. We talked about immediate spillover effects, we talked about that strategic leadership role and then these broader, higher level effects. And I think in the different um, examples we've already heard about, we can start to see that there are some different aspects that we might see some contribution from clusters um, being captured. Um, so Emily, can I go back to you and talk about, so that you can talk about um, uh, your response from the VINVAX program on, on this question? 
Yeah, yeah, and and all of the the things that I'm presenting now is kind of a result from the the research project that we been doing together, and it's based on a bottom up set of definitions and categories. When I say bottom up, I mean the Vindex initiatives themselves, the cluster initiatives themselves are putting words around what we broadly think of as these broader system level effects. What are they? And so the attempt has been like, okay, from the cluster initiatives own way of communicating, what is it that they think they are? So we started with this general, what is, what is a system level effect? What does that mean? Um, and there are a couple of different components of this definition that I'd like to talk through. And one is that it's um, more of a qualitative thing. It's a milestone or an event or a step forward in a strategic direction. It's less of a, a, of a quantitatively measured indicator, a, a thing that can be quantitatively measured. It's more qualitatively described. Um, second component of this definition is that it's, it's influenced by an action or a set of actions that the cluster initiative meant to influence. It's, it's part of their strategy. It's part of their, um, they are helping to influence moves forward along a strategic path or a transformative path. Um, they are among the actors. They're not the only one. So the idea of causality is, it's maybe a mission impossible. Uh, they're one of many different actors influencing this step forward, this strategic change process. Um, it's definitely long term. Um, it has a longer term impact on multiple organizations. So it's not just one company getting a new product or process but rather it's an entire set of actors, including those outside of the collaborative initiative. Uh, it's influencing things that, in, that affect the entire system of actors in a sectoral or a geographical, and we use the, the framework of innovation systems. But it's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's influencing more actors than are just participating in the collaborative initiative. So that's a kind of broader definition and different kind of components of that definition. And then we also worked on trying to define well, what kinds of system level events or milestones or what kind of things are we talking about here? And this was these categories, which is the next slide. Um, you can go ahead and, and change slides. These categories were developed uh, based on previous annual reports, what are kind of important events that they were reporting over their 10 year reporting period or whatever. They were looking back on what kind of things were they influencing and reporting as important happenings in the system. Um, and then we aim to develop a set of categories that were limited, a limited number of categories. And we ended up with a set of um, categories that neatly fit into this spillovers section, more related to what Porter would term factor conditions. So knowledge development and dissemination, experimentation and entrepreneurship, new companies, uh, investments, new investment in the system, and infrastructure. And this is a research and inf physical research and innovation infrastructure is what the Binbex initiatives influence. These also are neatly, can neatly map against innovation system functions. Um, then there were another set of categories that more fit within what we're calling strategic leadership or systemic leadership, um, that they are very active in uh, improving or positioning the, the innovation hub within the country or, or internationally and internationally. Uh, they're very active in forming new strategic partnerships with other business and innovation support actors um, in the system and also influencing policy or strategy. Um, so these categories were developed based on what the Vinvex initiatives do always or currently. Um, and then they, they fit within the, the categories that we were asked about. It, 
they can be grouped in those different categories, these kind of spillovers, more uh, spillovers on kind of the factor conditions of the, the functions of the system, it, as well as the strategic systemic leadership. And then if we go to the next slide, in addition to like uh, these kind of, uh, so this is in the reporting of these um, important happenings and by giving these categories names, we were able to kind of, uh, in the listing of events, and this I will get to in to how we evidence these system level effects, but we will go to the next slide again. <laughs> Yeah, so by giving the, the, the categories names, we were able to kind of code the different events and in fact give a picture of what the, the portfolio of index initiatives, what types of system level effects they're contributing to. And roughly, one can say that they, about half and half. I mean, it's, it's a different result. Last year, it was only uh, four initiatives that participated in the pilot group, but uh, this past year's reporting, we were able to do the whole portfolio of, I think it was uh, 10 initiatives were participating in listing their important events for the year. And they roughly fall into half of them are these immediate spillovers on the system, these factor conditions with knowledge, with knowledge development and dissemination and investment being big chunks. And investment, the, the N is, is national, investments and the I is international investments. And the same was with a uh, position and um, they're different that are coded national and international. Um, but, uh, and then on this uh, strategic leadership, they're very active in both forming these strategic partnerships and policy strategies, a big chunk of, of what the index initiatives do. And in the final slide for this question, uh, what, is, what about the higher level system effects? Um, the index initiatives, as well as other programs at Vinova, um, report on how they relate to or how they address the sustainable development goals. So this is actually work of a, a colleague or yeah, a colleague at Vinova, Ava Anderson, who's on the attendees list. She and Joran Anderson, who's also, they're no relation, Ava and Joran, but they both work on the VINVEX program and they're both among the attendees. But Ava did this summary of these reports for a, a certain set of VINVEX initiatives, how they contribute to the sustainable development goals. And then this is compared to how the strategic innovation initiatives also report to contrib contributing to the sustainable development goals. A um, couple interesting things about this picture is one that we're trying to link these two these innovation programs to how they're contributing to the SDGs. And two um, is that in addition to contributing to industrial progress and the, these, the sustainable development goals eight and nine, which are about um, economic growth and industrial innovation and infrastructure, they also are quite strong in contributing to green growth, uh, more the sustainability and gender equality related aspects. The VINVEX initiatives. And in particular, when it comes to gender equality in comparison to how this, the other program is contributing to gender equality. Kind of an interesting little aspect that VINVEX is working and contributing to. That's it for this section. Thank you, Emily. Um, it's interesting to see, the, see actually how the way that you were looking at your systemic level of effects have have mapped on reasonably well to the categories that we we've, we've been discussing as part of preparation for this pro this uh, um, this workshop today, um, and how the Vinvex um, uh, clusters are contributing to those and are capturing. But we'll come on to how they measure and capture in uh, in a little while. Joanne, do you want to talk a little bit about the the different levels of of, of effects that that your clusters are seeing? Yes, I would like to do it by sharing some specific cluster examples, if some related to shared value, some not, but I think that they're interesting, and a couple of examples to prove that we are not perfect, right? So two things that we are doing, but we, we should do better, okay? I'll tell you later on. First of all, in here you have the, the results of the survey that we uh, carry out every year, 
and the first question is that if we are having impact beyond our members, that's the first question that I think that we have to ask ourselves. Actually, this question is posed to the cluster members, to companies, and the answer is almost that 97% of cluster members say that the cluster initiative is having an impact beyond the borders of, of the cluster itself. So I think that's a good start. Now let, let, let's go and see some examples. So I, I would say that 29 out of 29 of our cluster organizations are working in the field of knowledge. Indeed, in, in generating, you know, specialized knowledge, in sharing knowledge. I think that the question of talent today is a, is a tricky thing. And I like that, you know, uh, clusters are demonstrating that they know the profiles for the future. And, and in here, I would like to, to make a comparison between cluster organizations and traditional organizations that sometimes they promote trainings that have always been there in their agendas. And I think that, for instance, in here, you have the examples of the, of the example of the beauty cluster. And from the beauty cluster, we identify a specific, you know, talent profiles that company needed and that they were not offered from the training institutions in Catalonia. So they decided to launch the beauty business school just to offer this specific training. I think it's a fantastic example of a transformational project from the cluster point of view related to talent, related to knowledge. Second thing I would like to talk about uh, startups. The, for me, the, the most interesting thing is that uh, startups and cluster organizations are similar species because we both exist to break the conventional wisdom. So uh, for us, it's important that cluster organizations don't see startups, you know, as a threat. So they are open to new entrants. In here, you have the breakdown of our members structure. You see that 7.3% of these 2,600 members are startups. You can think that this is a low percentage, but that actually it's quite high because the percentage of startups in our economy, it's not 7.3%. Even though Barcelona is one of the hottest startup, you know, environments worldwide. So in here you have the, the figure that shows that startups are participating more and more in our cluster initiatives. Let's see a couple of examples. I think that it's interesting that the startups are not always in biotech and in ICT clusters. I think that we all have this you know, examples from a long time ago, always speaking about these high tech sectors. And in here, I, I, I would like to share a couple of specific startup programs from the sports cluster and the fashion cluster. In here, we are promoting, you know, the, 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 not only the creation of startups, but basically the scale up phase and connection with venture capitalists, connection with mentors, so on and so forth. So, from one side, we have a sports tech, which is a trend worldwide. And the second side, we have fashion. So even in a traditional sector, you can have startups. And it is important that the cluster embraces these new entrants. I think that I can find a better example of showing the openness of a cluster to new entrants that the pork meat cluster, you know, speaking about meat-free protein. Okay, so in here you have a picture of the last strategic meeting of the pork meat cluster, and we were speaking about vegetarian food. You know, 15 years ago, that would have been impossible. But now, actually, one of the companies with the highest turnover in, in pork meat, 30% of the turnover is in vegetarian meat. So the understanding the trend, and I think it's a fantastic example of, of the sentence that disrupt or be disrupted. So much better to disrupt your business model from within than to wait that somebody from outside is going to do it. The thing that we have to improve, the first example is the attraction of foreign direct investment. I think that clusters are a fantastic tool to sell your country overseas and that gaps in the value chain of clusters are the fantastic signal where you have to, you know, invest your resources in order to attract a multinational to your country. We're doing so, in here you have one example with the electric vehicle and we have the automotive cluster and there is a connection between the automotive cluster and uh, our office of foreign direct investment, which belongs to our agency, in order to connect those gaps in the value chain with the, you know, the targets that we have to look for internationally. For instance, in terms of, of batteries, 
but this is one of the things we have to improve. Uh, this is one specific example, but I want to show it because I think that we all learn most when, when we also share some of our weaknesses. So this is one example about uh, a weakness that we have. And also I would like to talk a bit about the intercluster approach. Uh, around 10 years ago, we started our intercluster um, strategy. 100% of our 29 clusters are developing intercluster activities between them and also internationally. In here, I have this example of the optics and photonics cluster, uh, which are participating in an R&D consortia, for instance, with the Oslo cancer cluster, in order to solve the skin cancer. Basically, they have a target in order to reduce 25 days the time that you need to detect a potential skin cancer. And you know that in cancer, time is, is, uh, is gold. So this is a, a project with a, an impact, a potential impact internationally, you know, uh, really outstanding. And I think that interclusters generate these spillovers between sectors. So this is another concept, which I think is interesting, that clusters not only generate the spillovers into the sector itself, but also into other sectors. The second thing that we have to improve the most, uh, I saw that 70% of the respondents said that uh, uh, risk strategies are the main um, instrument for this type of, of effects in, in clusters. I would like to know a little bit more about the opinions regarding that. In here, you have one good example of a success case, which is our fashion cluster leading the, our risk three strategies related to fashion. This is the, ex the example of what we should have, you know? I think this, this connection from the very beginning of the design of the risk three strategies with implementation, but it's another thing that we have to do, you know, much better than we have done in, in the past. This is a good example. The, this cluster is leading a consortia of more than 30 firms and tech centers and universities with a grant of 3.5 million euros. And last but not least, I think that if we're speaking about higher level effects, we have to speak about the current situation. And I have many examples from the past, but I wanted to show these examples. We have several clusters working in order to participate in the design of COVID-19 free spaces. And in here you have three examples. Our railway cluster is designing a project in order to uh, participate in these, you know, different criteria. So people that use public transportation, for instance, are not worried about, you know, taking the metro. We have the food service clusters doing the same thing for restaurants. And we have our uh, contract for hotels cluster doing the same for hotels. So I can think in a, you know, better way of having an impact on society today than being a voice for improving the conditions related to the, the, the crisis that we have in all over the world. And also here, I would like, also related with the crisis, I, I really like this example. We have a, an educational technologies cluster, which has been fundamental in defining the framework for online educations, education at schools. So, for, with the crisis, I think that we have three main impacts. We have an impact on sanitary products and we have several cluster projects in there. We have an impact because we are locked down at home and this is related, for instance, with this example. So thanks to the EduTech cluster, there are more possibilities for kids to follow the education that is, you know, provided from schools. And the third example, I'm not, I'm not showing any case, but indeed is related to the recovery of consumption. Thank you, Joanne. There's some really good examples there. I particularly like the uh, um, the vegetarian product coming out of the non-meat, uh, out of the pork meat cluster. Um, that wasn't one that that uh, I don't think anybody expected. So, so it's great to see them expanding their and being open to, to new entrants and, and expanding their remit. Um, so, and, but using their capabilities to be able to do that. I also like the fact that you've brought in um, some of the current crisis responses to some of the current crisis. I think it's been incredible how clusters have got right into the center of how do we address some of those issues? How do we support uh, our, our member organizations 
through this crisis, but also how do we build collaboration? Clusters are so good at building collaborations. So finding different collaborations to address these issues, I think has been quite inspirational from some of the stories we've certainly seen through TCI. Uh, Federica, could you uh, just take us through then a couple of the, um, the outputs that you found from your, uh, your two different um, case studies you'd identified? Yes. Uh, just one thing about the paper, because I noticed we received uh, already some questions about the Motor Valley paper in the chat. Uh, I will just like to say that it will be published and so available online uh, on the Competence Review Journal, uh, because it has been awarded as the uh, best paper during the research day of the MOC network at Harvard Business School by Professor Michael Porter. So it will be soon uh, available uh, in the Competence Journal. Uh, so I that's that's great and it's good we'll sh we'll make sure that that gets shared the link gets shared but also just to um reassure people that the comments and, and the questions within the chat exactly. i know that i know that james is uh, um uh is going to is capturing some of them at the end of each section but but as part of the sharing and recording um you'll also be able to see the chat so there's been some i know that uh, that have been responded to in the in the chat um line as we go along Yes, Fernando is already answering to some of them, uh, but we will uh, uh, we'll answer to all of them. Um, so, uh, going back to our cases, uh, um, as I said, we decided to analyze these two uh, Italian uh, cases, uh, starting from the strategy they designed and adopted for cluster development, uh, and then try to see how they uh, measure the results, um, how they keep track of the, 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 the results uh, achieved during the, the last years. Um, the wellness ecosystem, uh, the wellness cluster is uh, actually a new uh, social and cultural model. So they aim at creating this new uh, wellness uh, model for everyone, uh, for every citizen and people in, uh, in the region, trying to increase their um, healthy condition and their, their lifestyle uh, toward a new idea, a new vision of, uh, of wellness. Um, and over the, the last uh, 15 years, uh, they worked uh, basically on the eight main um, areas of activities uh, that you can see uh, here in the slide. So for sure, they work on uh, health and prevention uh, areas because um, their model is based more on prevention than on the, uh, giving the cure uh, for uh, chronic diseases. For example, they work a lot on the prevention side. Uh, and thanks to... Um, super successful uh, collaboration with the regional healthcare system. Uh, they also managed to, uh, they, they uh, Emilia Romagna, that is the region where the Wellness Valley is located, has been the first one in Italy that allowed uh, the indication of physical exercise in the medical prescription for people. So thanks to the program uh, Exercises Medicine, as the cluster uh, named it, uh, they managed to obviously uh, also increase knowledge and share knowledge and information and educate uh, citizens and people about the importance of this um, the wellness lifestyle. Um, they work a lot on the nutrition uh, to improve uh, the dietary and the food habits of people. So trying to increase uh, the, uh, for example, the consumption of fruits and vegetables. Uh, on this uh, specific area, they also launched the first uh, B2B uh, trade fair specifically dedicated to the fruits and vegetables the supply chains. And it's uh, still, the, I think, the, the only one in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they launched many outdoor uh, programs in order to uh, bring the physical exercise into the lives of people at any stages of their lives. Uh, and so to combat sedentary uh, lifestyle. Um, they also work on uh, uh, improving uh, the education uh, in, uh, in the region. Uh, they are now collaborating with 15 uh, university departments. And uh, two years ago, they also launched the first uh, uh, wellness uh, course, uh, Wellness um, uh, Master of Science uh, with the University of Bologna. So specifically focused on this uh, uh, new, new idea of wellness. Um, in tourism uh, uh, sector, in the tourism industry, um, as the Motor Valley did, they also worked on the creation of specific uh, touristic packages uh, around the idea, this idea of wellness. So they created uh, also certification. So for example, if you are a restaurant uh, and you are including also some vegan or vegetarian uh, menus in your offer, uh, and you also meet uh, many other uh, requirements uh, you, you, you can uh, obtain uh, this uh, certification. 
there are now 30 certified uh, hotels in, um, in, in Emilia Romagna. They have 12 uh, spa and resorts and they, uh, uh, they also have been able to launch many, many successful and important uh, events. Uh, for example, the Wellness Week, it's an entire week uh, completely dedicated to uh, wellness, uh, sports, uh, physical exercise, uh, culture, uh, health, uh, and so on. And last year, they attracted 300,000 people uh, just in that week. So I think it's a huge success for a single event. Um, and then they are also um, designing uh, and creating new uh, corporate programs, trying to improve the uh, working condition of the employees uh, actively involved uh, in, in the cluster, perfectly in line with the idea of share value of uh, Professor Porter. Uh, they also are working on the urban uh, uh, planning of the, the cities uh, in the region, trying to create a more and more uh, spaces where people can uh, do physical exercise, can run, can use bikes uh, for for example, parks uh, or cycle paths and so on. And so I, I think we can say they're working uh, on the creation of a new wellness lifestyle for people uh, in, in the region uh, in general. Um, slide, please. Uh, so we'll be, I think it would be in, impossible uh, to, um, to give information uh, or a whole picture of what they are doing. Um, but the important thing here is that they have always kept track uh, of the results uh, achieved, especially in the last years, where uh, when they have identified uh, the, um, some metrics, uh, some indicators, specifically focused on giving evidence uh, of the results uh, achieved in terms of health, of sustainable economic development, uh, and on the tourism and territory promotion. Um, so as we can see here, we have, uh, uh, I think, measures uh, and indicators of uh, uh, both immediate spillover effect and higher level system effects. Uh, so for example, in terms of health, they are measuring the percentage of active population compared to the Italian national average, or uh, the overweight population, or the population, the percentage of people who consumes daily fruits and vegetables, but also, for example, uh, the number of patients uh, uh, hospitalized due to chronic disease, uh, or the number of uh, uh, the, the percentage of people uh, uh, at risk of disabilities uh, in the region. And they compare each metrics uh, to the um, national uh, average. Uh, they are obviously uh, keeping track of, of uh, some more business-oriented uh, um, indicators. So for example, uh, uh, they keep track of the number of firms or the number of employees involved in the wellness industry. They have identified some um, um, ATECO um, code for the, the, the industrial classification uh, uh, system. Um, I, I cannot remember the name in, in the European, the NACE codes, sorry, uh, specifically dedicated to the wellness industries, included in the wellness industries. So they are now able to track uh, the number of firms and employees and the value created by these, uh, these firms. Um, in, in this case, uh, we can see the percentage uh, um, between 2011 and 2018, and they always compare these numbers to the at the national uh, and the regional, uh, uh, the regional level. So for example, in terms of uh, number of firms, uh, we can see here that the wellness uh, industry increased by 12%. Uh, all the other regional sectors, uh, they decreased by 7% in the same uh, time frame. Yes. Um, in terms of tourism and territory promotion, they are, for example, uh, measuring the added value created by the wellness events uh, I mentioned before. Uh, so, for example, uh, for the wellness week, as I said, uh, they, um, they, they uh, measure number of visitors uh, from all over the world that uh, um, came into the region uh, last year. Uh, and these, vis these visitors were uh, 300,000 people. So uh, I think it's a huge result. Um, they are also, they have also identified uh, four out of the 17 uh, uh, SDGs of the United Nations uh, on which according to, to them, they are working more with their projects. Uh, so the, the sustainable development goals on which they are creating the greatest impact uh, thanks to their initiative. And they are, for example, the health uh, 
uh, the, 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 I, I don't think that we can uh, read well these, uh, these um, the SDGs uh, here, but anyway, they are the health one, the climate, uh, um, the climate change one, uh, the um, economic growth, uh, sustainable growth, uh, and the one on uh, the quality of the infra infrastructure uh, for all their urban planning. Um, in uh, Lombardia Space Cluster, we did the same. So we analyzed uh, what they did in the last 10 years to develop the, the cluster. The aim here was to develop and stimulate the competitiveness of, uh, especially of the SMEs included in uh, actively involved in the cluster with the aim of upgrading uh, their supply chain, for example, and increasing uh, uh, their international uh, visibility. Um, so they identified five uh, working groups uh, uh, which they are working uh, and launching many, many initiatives every year. Uh, we have the technical scientific board, uh, that is the more the, the, the R&D side uh, of the cluster, that is uh, uh, focused more on the innovation, uh, um, fostering innovation for the cluster members. Uh, they map uh, every year, uh, they do this uh, technological scouting uh, in order to design uh, the technological um, strategy plan. Uh, to guide uh, regional policy and the allocation of funds, thanks to this, uh, uh, to this, uh, to their plan. Um, they work on the supply chain of firms, uh, and as uh, uh, also in, in this case, uh, they keep track of the main weaknesses, uh, the main gaps uh, in the supply chain of their, uh, especially uh, for their small and micro uh, companies uh, involved in the cluster, and then they develop specific programs to help them uh, and at best qualifying their uh, supply chain in international markets. Um, they are now working on a specific on the environmental certification, for example, helping uh, SMEs uh, to uh, obtain uh, this kind of certification that are not uh, so easy to be <laughs> achieved for a small or micro company, uh, especially in, in an aerospace industry, they are really tough. Um, on the education and training side, they work to uh, bridge a skills gap. In the region, they had this, uh, uh, the, the main weakness was uh, a lack in uh, specialized education for students. So they developed many collaboration with technical institutes. Another initiative that I think is really, uh, has been really successful uh, and interesting uh, um, has been done with the um, training uh, courses uh, of the firms, uh, so on the education and the training opportunities uh, of the, the firms, uh, when they asked uh, prime contractors to open the doors of their training courses uh, to the SMEs uh, involved in the cluster. So this was, uh, I think, really a huge opportunity uh, for all the small companies uh, uh, in the cluster. Uh, then they obviously uh, organize joint participation of cluster and companies uh, in uh, international air shows uh, and B2B trade fairs. Um, and finally, the business networking uh, uh, working group uh, was actually was born a few years ago, thanks to a single initiative. But this initiative was such a success that they decided to focus an entire working group around this uh, because it, it was really, really a success. They tried to increase uh, business opportunities uh, for their members and so they organize these uh, uh, b2b short meetings uh, not just among the cluster members but also with firms uh, in other aerospace uh, uh, clusters that are maybe uh, more close to to our to the lombardy one uh, in the program cluster to cluster um, so as the wellness ballet they have always uh, kept track of these uh, the results um, uh, achieved in the other in the next slide uh, we can uh, show you how they did this. Um, as we can see here, they are keeping track of the results achieved. Um, as we said, as uh, Madeline said in the introduction, they are not just uh, uh, keeping track to give evidence of uh, uh, the results achieved, but also to uh, adjust the course of action. So to inform the next strategic and uh, operative direction uh, for the cluster. So every year they keep track of, uh, of these uh, and try to uh, uh, inform the next steps uh, in, uh, uh, from a strategic and operative uh, uh, perspective. Um, as we can see here, they uh, measure business results in terms of, for example, number of firms, employees, uh, turnover, and most important uh, in terms of export, because it's really an important aspect of the aerospace industry. Uh, but not just for the cluster members, but at the ecosystem level. So trying to compare what they are achieving uh, for their members uh, with the results achieved by the uh, 
the regional uh, aerospace uh, system uh, uh, at large. Uh, and then they keep track of all these, um, th these are just some of them, not, not all of them, uh, of course, but it was just to give you an idea of all the indicators and uh, metrics that they uh, measure, uh, they use to, to measure the results achieved in each one of the five uh, working groups. Uh, so, for example, in the education uh, working group, uh, they keep track of the number of scholarships uh, that they are able to give to the students uh, involved. Uh, in, uh, in the aerospace courses, aerospace schools, uh, or the number of participants to each one of their the, your training uh, uh, initiative, the courses they launch specifically focus uh, on aerospace industries, um, or from the technical and scientific working group, they keep track of the number of uh, specific uh, research projects that has been launched, uh, especially thanks to the uh, initiatives of the cluster and the number of uh, participation in this uh, in this project. Um, when it comes to uh, strategic leadership effects, uh, I think that in the case of the Wellness Valley, this picture uh, really gives you an, an, an idea of uh, uh, how much they um, work well in the last year, because when they put your name uh, in the exit uh, of your highway, <laughs> I think you can say that you did a good job <laughs> in, uh, in establishing collaboration uh, with uh, the, the public stakeholders in your region. Um, uh, but it, it, it's a joke, but it's really, uh, I think it gives you really an, an idea of what they did in the last 15 years. Uh, and I think the, the, the model, uh, the governance model that they, I, they adopted uh, really helped them in uh, achieving these uh, important results. Uh, because since the very beginning, uh, for example, they established this strategic committee uh, involving uh, the president of Emilia Romagna and the president uh, of the University of Bologna. So two of the most important public stakeholders uh, in the region. And together with them, they define every year the strategic plan uh, and they sign a memorandum of understanding uh, in which they say, okay, we aim at reaching uh, these uh, goals, these results together in the, in the next year. So I think this was really, really important in guiding uh, policies. Ah, no, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, as I said, they also uh, managed to establish a super successful collaboration and a long-standing collaboration with the public healthcare system. Uh, in the case of the Lombardy Aerospace Cluster, uh, they are working uh, uh, with the, at, at the regional level and at the national level. So at both this, uh, uh, this level, trying to collaborate uh, uh, together in guiding and driving uh, uh, policies. For example, with the Lombardy region, um, they have a regular meeting with the uh, other technological clusters I mentioned uh, uh, before, together with uh, a representative from the Lombardy region and from Fin Lombarda, that is the financial institution of the region, uh, driving the allocation of funds for policies. So I think it's important to sit at the same table uh, together. <laughs> Um, they obviously um, contributed to the elaboration of the smart specialization strategy uh, and also to the elaboration of the national plan for scientific research because uh, uh, the Ministry of um, uh, Industry and Research, the Italian uh, uh, Ministry of Research, asked the, the national cluster to elaborate this plan and the national cluster then asked for support to that, the other aerospace uh, uh, regional cluster. So in this way, they managed to collaborate all together. And finally, uh, in the last 10 years, they also have been able to sign free memorandum of understanding uh, with uh, the regional education office to uh, drive and guide together uh, some educational programs uh, um, that I mentioned you before for students of technical institutes uh, and with uh, uh, universities in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Frederica. Uh, actually, it's gonna be my new measurement framework is, are you on the nearest road sign? <laughs> that's got to, that's got to be a, a good nice. indication that you you are an a, a key part of your your regional um your regional strategy yes uh, i think maybe there is one slide more uh i oh, know okay there was a uh another thing i'd like to to say but well, i don't know if it's now or later on it might be later on i would say okay. you have more slides to come so okay sorry no that's fine um, James, do you want to just talk through some of our um, responses on the survey about what people said for their broader system level improvements? 
Yeah, I mean, we've heard some great examples, very detailed examples there from the three speakers of uh, different types of improvements. In the survey, we, we or different types of uh, effects from clusters. We, in the survey, we split that up into these three categories, looking at immediate spillover effects, this kind of effects on strategic leadership rather than higher level effects. Um, and uh, I think we've seen a lot of great examples there from, uh, from, from, from Italy and Catalonia and Sweden uh, of how those are measured in practice. Um, if we look at the survey results, we can see, I think, no surprise when it comes to immediate spillover effects that knowledge and development, uh, knowledge development and dissemination kind of wins the day with almost 100% of people identifying that as the key uh, immediate spillover effect. Um, experimentation and entrepreneurship comes in second there, uh, and that I think uh, chimes with uh, with Joanne's ideas on uh, on startups and, uh, and kind of the, the increasing importance of startups in, uh, in in cluster dynamics. And then uh, and then with less residences, investment and, and infrastructure. If we move on to the to the next slide, we can see strategic leadership roles. And the interesting thing here was that there was a fairly kind of broad impact across all of the, the potential ideas that we that we put in the survey so we can see that actually people suggest that clusters are playing uh, quite a broad strategic leadership role from having a voice to the sector through developing reputation influencing policy uh, and most importantly building strategic partnerships and if we look at the higher level effects there we do see quite a big distinction it's the environmental agendas again perhaps not surprisingly given the the importance of the environmental agendas and the increasing importance in the in the framework for example of the european green deal etc that uh, and the sustainable development goals um, that it's it's really environmental agendas where we see the most important impact of clusters beyond the kind of traditional typical economic effects uh, and less so uh, equality and diversity social inclusion well-being but still quite significantly uh, identified as uh, as potentially important effects um, just to summarize summarize some of the questions that were coming in um, uh, and just to pick out a few, um, Paquita um, mentions, and more of a comment than a question, responding to, to Joanne's note on the or example of the pork stroke uh, non-meat involvement, spans actually um, how fast the pragmatism of clusters develops. It often takes the group into uncharted territory. So it's a very interesting point there on how sometimes you might start off looking for some types of effects, but you, you actually go into quite different territory quite quickly because of the, the type of dynamics within clusters. Um, Starem is asking also with regards uh, Joanne's presentation, I uh, would like to know a bit more uh, from, from speakers on this idea of the COVID free spaces and the opportunity that that offers uh, for broad European cluster collaboration or for promotion of European shared value. Um, and a more specific question from Uli on the term immediate spillovers. This is perhaps something that, uh, that Emily might be best placed to answer, um, given, that, uh, given her presentation kind of making that very clear distinction between the different uh, effects. Um, in the context of immediate effects of cluster activities, uh, not sure you understand exactly what spillovers means. Do we call them spillovers because they reach far beyond user stakeholders within the cluster initiative? Uh, but that could, of course, be intended by the policy. So where's the distinction between what we might call an actual effect of the cluster initiative itself and then a spillover effect? Uh, so just a couple of questions there uh, on the COVID space and on the, on the spillover effect to see if our uh, panelists might want to respond quickly. Just to, um, I, I'm going to um, hold those thoughts. So if you can think about those and maybe we'll can come back into in the final bit, because I'm aware that we've got less than half an hour to do the, the last bits. And I, I do want to get a, a chance to have a little bit of final reflections from the from the panelists. It is an interesting question that you uh, you raised there early, but I think we had some debate even as we were putting this um, survey together about what do we call it. Um, and so um, I think Trying to find a language that works is, is going to be, uh, this would be the kind of thing that, that the cluster evaluation working group does really well, where we're testing and iterating and saying, actually, no, that just about captures it. Maybe spillover effects isn't quite working at the moment. So that's one for us to, to work on. But for the other aspects, I think um, if you can consider those panelists and we will come back for your final reflections, because I am keen that we don't, don't miss out on the chance to answer these, this final question. Because ultimately, um, I think that's probably what people are really interested in. That's great. We can try to categorize these, um, these factors. But how do we monitor and evidence them? I think that's the real question. How are you going about measuring? Some of these? We've heard a little bit about them in the way that you've described your studies. But it's just trying to get a little bit more under the skin of the monitoring and evidencing the difference you make in those areas and how you then communicate that to uh, the different audiences. Emily, do you want to kick off? 
with sure, uh, sure. yours. And I'm, I'm going to hop on this, uh, Ulrich, uh, to comment on your question. Um, the, the categories that were defined in, 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 by the Wienbex folks in, in terms of the research, ongoing research project, they, were, they defined the list of those seven categories. Um, they were not grouped into what, what we're using, the headers here with spillovers and um, systemic leadership or strategic leadership. But as Madeline is saying, this is great that we're, we've tested these like headlines. Uh, is there's ways of grouping these categories? And if you could suggest some alternatives for these groupings, that would be great. So please, your homework <laughs> as you listen to the last bit is to put in some different. How how would you otherwise group these these kinds of system level effects, or would you? Um, so to the third question about how, how is it that you evidence these system level effects over time? Because I think it's very important that um, cluster initiatives do contribute. We've been hearing so many examples of how they contribute to these system level effects. And oftentimes it's not really um, highlighted as such in a lot of the monitoring and evaluation work. And how is it that we can do a better job of highlighting this, these types of effects that cluster initiatives deliver? In the Wienbex case, there was a kind of a base to work from. As I mentioned initially, a part of their annual reporting is to list in this, in the bottom left portion of the slide in very small font, is an example of this Excel sheet. They're supposed to list important events that have happened through the year. Um, and what the what we did is to basically give them a language in order to categorize these events to make them uh, discussable across initiatives. Um, so they have for a number of years been reporting on these important events and there's no minimum number of events and there's no way of saying, you know, what is an important event. It's in, they, they describe the event and they describe the clusters the cluster initiatives contribution or why if they were involved how is it that they were involved in, in you know making this thing happen and then uh, we've added this words around these categories around what type of system level effect is this and they themselves categorize what what this is and the reason we did this is a to to make it uh, discussable uh, across initiatives like okay or a bunch of initiatives working on research and innovation infrastructure for instance for instance but b to relate it to their strategy uh, to be able to discuss progress towards realizing their strategic development and transformation aims over time what what steps towards that long term path are they fulfilling over time um, and we, um, so we added these categories and then we also described in this, in the top left portion of this screen, we developed a little guide, the little tips of how is it that you can document this over time, journals, uh, you know, a certain file in your inbox, uh, interviewing your stakeholders with some kind of uh, re regularity. How is it that you can collect information on important events? for the year and then kind of compile those in for your annual reports and that was in the guide and and also in the guide is how is it that you can use that information in your strategy continual development of your strategy and implementation plans over time um, so this part of reporting on uh, system level effects is part of the annual reporting process. It's embedded in what these index initiatives report on every year. Um, what we did with the categories is it gives new possibilities for visualizing and comparing. Uh, visualizing what kinds of things each initiative is doing, what kinds of system level effects they're contributing to, and also for the portfolio as a whole. What does the index portfolio contribute to? Um, and that ideally would be able to relate to other programs, other innovation programs, what kinds of system level effects are they working on? Um, but we're not there yet. It's just within Vindex so far. Next slide, please. So this, yeah, this one is just uh, on the right, you have pictures from the pilot initiatives uh, during 
uh, 2018's reporting. And on the left is the most recent annual reporting, 2019. And it's three different VINDEX initiatives, Future Biorefinery, Paper Province, and Automation Region. And this just gives you a picture of cluster initiatives or VINDEX initiatives contribute to a myriad of system level effects. There's, they're not just focused on one thing or two things. They, they contribute to a number of different system level effects, however you want to group them or call them. Um, and that these effects do maybe, maybe they're different in different years because maybe one year you have a focus on developing, for instance, a particular research program uh, or attracting investment and maybe another year you're, you're uh, focused on uh, influencing policy or some regulation or public procurement. Um, so this is just a way of visualizing what they're working on, what strategic aims they have, and, and, and progress over time. And to be able to trace this, uh, yeah, over different, these different milestones over years. And so this gives a kind of a percentage of these events that they're listing, but behind these numbers are actual texts describing what is it, what is this milestone about? Um, so it gives a more, structured approach to evidencing these, these milestones along the strategic path. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, uh, and about communicating system level change, I think it's extremely difficult, but also extremely important that these kind of system level effects get highlighted that initiatives not only uh, communicate on firm level economic performance, but they also tell the story about these system level effects that they're uh, achieving or contributing to. And I think the audience, um, I listed two here. Uh, one is, and I think primarily, it's the cluster initiative themselves. It's, uh, it's being able to show their stakeholders and their steering bodies it kind of evidencing we are working with strategic higher level ambitions to affect the whole system um, and this is what we're doing these are the kind of steps that we're achieving and then uh, secondarily i think it's to the funders and the kind of policy and program level bodies to help them evidence to their funders what kind of um, this instrument is not only an initiative, uh, an instrument to achieve firm level competitiveness, but also to influence system level advantages and improvements. And then how to communicate. Um, a lot of times it's anecdotal, it's success stories. And I think it's important to, you know, have these stories to be able to, to explain the complexity of these kind of actions and system level effects, because I don't think it can be easily boiled down to a particular indicator or even a set of indicators. Um, but I also think it's highly effective to have some kind of visual uh, to be able to, to see over time this set of stories, like what does that mean? And, and here's a picture from Future Biorefinery. So they are one of the graduating VINFEX initiatives and they went, when they graduate the program, they're asked to submit kind of a report of their period of development over time. And they developed a timeline with these little boxes of text, which are kind of little uh, inputs from these important events, important milestones over time. They're able to take these from their annual reports and put them in a timeline. And then the trend lines on the, on the red, it's the number of firms involved in the collaborative effort over time. And it's reaching over 160, I think. And then the blue is the kind of the, the budget or the rev the kind of the amount of financing that the initiative is working with. Um, so it's kind of their annual budget for the collaborative initiative. And you're able to see that both of these kind of more quantitative indicators, like the trend line of this, and then different milestones over time. So these kind of visuals I think are powerful for uh, communicating the the impact and, and how these collaborative initiatives develop over time and are able to achieve more and more ambitious system level effects over time. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. I, I agree. I think that visual um, timeline 
uh, that you showed at the end there is a really good way of mixing a few quantitative um, bits of information together with a qualitative story about this is what we did over time. So that's quite nice to see those, those brought together into that timeline. Joanne, do you want to just talk a little bit about um, uh, how you're evidencing um, these aspects within Catalonia? Yeah, sure. We, we carry out a systematic evaluation and basically divide it into two. In here you can see that one part of the evaluation is uh, answered by cluster managers and this one is, is uh, developed annually. Every year we carry out this evaluation with 49 questions answered by cluster managers. Then we have that every two years all members are responding and we have a firm's questionnaire with 25 questions. Not 100% of what I presented is, you know, demonstrated with a specific metric. So indeed there is an ongoing process. Every year we try to improve the system. Some of the things I presented, we have a specific metrics and now I'm going to show a specific example, but not, not everything. Here you have the example. I, I told you before that uh, one of the things we have to improve is a better connection between the RS3 strategies and clusters. In here you have a specific question uh, that we pose to cluster managers and then you see that 43% uh, of clusters participate in the two uh, related instruments that we have in Catalonia for RS3. So if 43% is a success or a failure. It depends on how you look at it, but I would like it to be 100% for sure. So I think that this is one thing that we have to, to improve. So monitoring, as you always say in this working group, and here it is a good example, is not about auditing the past, but about getting strategic information for the future. And I really like the, the way that you summarize this uh, th this working group and I, I, I just wrote it here because it's a fantastic example of, of this example. So then concerning share value, we need a specific metrics. I already told you that we believe in the big corp system at the firm level, but the firm level is not enough. But I would like to have something like this article here. So this article was published last August and it's a, a, a well-known company in Catalonia. And the summary is the, the chairman was saying that the company turnover is 365 million euros. But the interesting thing is that the social impact is more than 500 million euros. And the interesting thing is not that the social impact is higher than the turnover. The interesting thing is that they have the figure. And I don't. Th I can tell you that since this information, you know, was published in August, in hundred percent of the conferences I deliver about share value, I always ask, how many of you know the social impact monetized? And the number of raised hands is usually equal to zero. Okay. So for me, this this is the summary of the type of metrics that we need, which is the social impact monetized. Anyway, Excuse me, Joan, Patricia here. Can you, there is some background noise. Can you check your headphones? It's completely quiet here. Yeah, but there is some kind of uh, background noise when you speak. Maybe it's too close to your mouse or something. Or the, the time. No. No. Can, can you try now? Thank you. Yeah, yeah that sounds better. Sound better? Yep. Great. Thank do, you. Do we have to repeat what I said or it's not needed? No, I think I think you can carry on from where you are. Um, and do you want the next slide? Yeah, if you want, ju just what I was explaining here, which is important. So I was I was saying that we need a specific metric to, related to share value. And in here we have a good example of a company that not only knows the turnover, which is something that all companies know, but also the social impact monetized. And some metrics that I think that uh, are interesting in, in terms of share value and some metrics that probably we're going to have for, for the near future. One indeed would be the number of clusters with share value embedded in the strategy. Today, this figure is five, the five pilots that I told you. So five out of 29, we still have to work to engage the other 24 clusters. Another figure would be the percentage of cluster funded projects which are share value. The figure for last year funding was 
So we need to improve this. We're at the beginning of, of this journey. Another specific metrics would be number of firms engaged in shared value projects, number of firms applying the Bicorp assessment tool, number of firms Bicorp certified, number of agents involved in shared value projects. I think that by definition, shared value projects need you know, the coordination of different stakeholders, private, public. And the, the last thing that, that I already talked about, which is the global social impact monetized. As for communication, we have systematic instruments to communicate uh, the evaluation that we're carrying out. At the top of this pyramid, you have one which is targeting policymakers and the leading CEOs. We have the Catalonia Clusters Consultative Committee, which basically is a meeting that we're holding a couple of times a year. And we have our minister, we have the cluster chairman, and in there we're sharing the results of the evaluation. Below this, we're having as a target cluster organizations and cluster members. We co-design with all cluster boards the evaluation. Last year, I had 29 meetings with the 29 boards presenting the evaluation and having feedback from them. We also have a couple of co-design meetings with the cluster managers. And in all strategic cluster um, immersions, we also share the results of evaluation. And at the bottom of, the, of, the, of this triangle, indeed we have as an audience, non-members and society. And we try to talk to opinion leaders, we try to have our communication materials like this brochure and indeed be as active as possible in media. Can you confirm that the sound was good? It's a, there's a little bit of a hiss when you speak, but I think we got, um, we could hear it was better when you adjusted your microphone. So thank you for that, John. Federica, uh, would you like to just talk about how you measure and the evidence um, uh, within the case studies that you were studying? Yes, thank you. Uh, in, uh, in the wellness Stanley case, uh, uh, they have always kept track of the, the, achieve, uh, the achieved results. In the first year, especially thanks to the uh, external support of the regional statistic office uh, and of some academic professors that help, uh, help them uh, in uh, uh, measuring the, the results. But I think it's uh, important here to highlight that since last year, since 2018, sorry, um, the cluster has also its own uh, observatory, so the Wellness Valley Observatory. Uh, it's an initiative of the Emilia Romagna regional government and is made up of many different professionals with uh, uh, complementary uh, expertise uh, and, uh, and competencies uh, and so they are able to uh, they've been able to develop a specific methodology uh, to measure the results and the impact they have created. Uh, here you can uh, you can um, uh, see the report uh, that they every year uh, publish. Uh, the report is public available on their website so they they don't just share um, the results achieved with their uh, stakeholders, with their members, but with the, the public in general. Uh, especially the president of the cluster, uh, Neri Alessandri, is the, the founder and CEO of uh, Technogym, who launched the, the initiative, as I said before, uh, is really, really, mm, I can say, charismatic uh, in uh, um, uh, exporting uh, this uh, new vision of wellness all over the world. Uh, he's been uh, for seven years, uh, I think eight years in a row now, one of the main speakers at the World Economic Forum of Davos, uh, talking about wellness, uh, his wellness idea and how to improve the well-being uh, of citizens uh, and of the society. And in fact, in 2016, um, the World Economic Forum presented uh, a report, a study called The Future of Health, and in this study, they put the Wellness Valley as a, an international best practice, an international benchmark on how to develop this kind of uh, sustainable health uh, systems, specifically focused on prevention uh, rather, rather than on uh, the cure of uh, chronic disease. Um, so I think they, they achieved great results even in giving evidence uh, of their uh, results. Um, in the aerospace uh, cluster case, uh, in the next slide. Uh, again, uh, um, even in this case, uh, uh, since the very beginning, since day one of their uh, of their history, they uh, try to keep track of the of the results uh, through uh, primary and secondary data. So thanks to survey with their cluster members, uh, but also thanks to uh, analysis. Um, 
of other kind of the of, of data at, uh, spe specifically um, at the ecosystem and regional level. Um, the cluster manager is uh, also the head of the research department uh, of the provincial entrepreneurial association where the cluster is based. So the focus uh, on the measurement uh, and the, the, the development of this kind of methodology has always been really, really strong for the uh, aerospace cluster. Uh, they, they, um, they have always uh, tried to give evidence of the results, especially to give uh, uh, evidence of their initiatives and activities to their stakeholders and to the, to the members involved. Uh, I, I, I know that, for example, uh, for large firms uh, involved in the cluster, it's really important to understand why uh, they are still involved in the, in the cluster. And so they have always focused, uh, um, they have always tried to, to give evidence to them of, the, of what they were doing for them. Um, so they give evidence of this uh, through an annual report that they share with the cluster members uh, during their annual, uh, annual meeting. Uh, as I said before, they keep track of the results achieved by the cluster organization in its uh, internal uh, and external networking uh, and for each one of the five uh, working groups. Uh, they give evidence to the Lombardy region through a specific dashboard that every clusters in the region uh, every one of the nine technological cluster had to uh, fill in. Uh, this dashboard is made up of uh, some fixed indicators for uh, six main areas, uh, like the state of development of the cluster, the financial sustainability of the cluster, R&D, internationalization, and communication, for example. Uh, and finally, to, to the public, to the general audience, uh, thanks to their, your website uh, and the, the press releases uh, uh, that they regularly, um, regularly give. In, in the last slide, uh, I, I, I uh, put here a picture that the cluster, the Lombardiero Space Cluster, put in its annual uh, uh, report uh, last year, in, uh, in 2019, as you can see here. And uh, it's uh, just a picture of their uh, agenda, of the cluster organization. But I think it's really strong in giving evidence of what they are doing uh, and to give evidence to their uh, members uh, of what they daily uh, do <laughs> uh, for, for them. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the three main areas on which they're working, so the internationalization, uh, the technological uh, side, or the business networking uh, initiatives. So they just put this picture at the end of the annual report, uh, and I think it could be a, a nice and funny uh, idea to give evidence of their uh, support and what they are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Frederica. I know I really like the, the year planner. That's um, looking scarily like my diary full of Zoom meetings <laughs> at the moment. I don't know about anybody else. But um, finally, uh, um, just looking at the, what we got back in seven, I'm really, uh, really aware of time. We are literally on, on countdown. So James, very briefly, what, what did uh, our, our participants say in their survey responses? Well, it was, uh, it's again very much in line with what we've heard from the presenters. Uh, case studies and success story presenta preparation is, is kind of the, the top, uh, um, uh, the most represented. Um, only about 50% do the kind of systematic documentation that, uh, that Emily was talking about and that come through also in Federica's examples. Um, and, uh, and again, in line with, with Joanne's comments, uh, only about 40% actually look at quasi-economic measures, trying to estimate the, the, the economic impact of some sets and reveal 20% don't, uh, don't consider any type of monitoring of this type of wider impact. So, so there's, an, there's, there, there's interesting scope here for, 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 for improving, I think, the, um, th this type of activity. And if we move on to the, to the next slide in terms of who the audience was, again, I think, as, as would expect, cluster members um, and national regional government funders are the two key, um, are the two key audiences that this, uh, this monitoring needs to be hitting. I think um, I think we'll move on just to final reflections um, uh, for from the um, from the presenters and any final comments that um, may have come through through Q and A because we as I say we're on countdown for the last couple of minutes of our session and I appreciate that for some people it is very early in the morning and for some people it is the middle of the night so I don't want to go overrun our two hours if we can uh, if we can avoid it so Emily did you just want to um, talk about uh, um, some final reflections from your point of view. You are still muted. 
So if you can unmute, Thank there you, you go. Yes, there you go. There you go. I was so excited. Uh, <laughs> I think that um, although uh, system effects are, because they're kind of further out from the direct effects that cluster initiatives directly work towards, they tend to be qualitative. Um, although they're qualitative, I think it's extremely important to evidence how cluster initiatives are contributing to these system level change processes. And, um, and this kind of strength and understanding just by the fact that we're talking about this and showing that all cluster initiatives from different parts of the world do contribute to system level effects. I think it's one step in that direction and, and putting words around things and trying to get a, a broader understanding and a structured approach to, yeah, to, to help improve that we all understand that cluster initiatives do contribute or some cluster initiatives contribute and we need to be better about maybe using the same words and, and trying to communicate this in a good way. Um, and structured approaches do help improve robustness and, and kind of evidence, the evidence base. And although it's difficult to communicate these system level effects and try to show how clusters are contributing to these, um, these kind of initial definitions that we're working with and some, some kind of categories, whatever we end up, Ulrich, you know, whatever he comes with, <laughs> is what we should call them. It's, it's, um, it's a helpful start to kind of relate to the initiative's own strategy. What is it that they're intending to influence, to be able to, to track it over time, um, and to enable learning between initiatives. And also to, to kind of show all the different reasons why clusters matter, you know, not just for firm competitiveness, but for the broader system. Um, I think it's important to gather evidence, but I think it's more important that you gather useful evidence, that that evidence is used. Um, and to, to toot your own horn, to show that you're, you're making progress, uh, the cluster initiatives are making progress, but more importantly, to go back to Joanne's point, is to inform, to guide strategy development and inform strategy and prioritization of actions. That this kind of uh, monitoring and evaluation effort is primarily to, because if system level effects are for the longer term transformative reasons, you need to be able to inform that longer term uh, activity over time. Okay, thank you, Emily. Joanne, did you want to say a couple of last words? I hope you don't hear me like Nirvana, but like Bob Dylan. That sounds much better. Okay, perfect. Because as, as you know, Bob Dylan sang the times they are changing. And I think that's the perfect summary for the current situation. So th three conclusions, maybe more, more general than specifically speaking about what we, we talked about today. But one thing I think that clusters, uh, cluster organizations sh should be open to change, should embrace change. I think that the future is going to be about change and about changing our business model, our you know values, our strategies uh, very fast. So my, my first conclusion is, you know, don't be afraid of change, but try to drive the, this change. Second thing, we are observing that during this crisis, many firms are approaching our cluster organizations for answers that uh, usually or should be offered by traditional associations. And by definition, we play different games. I think that we were born to be the resistance against the establishment. And I think that there is an interesting trade-off today if we want to still be part of the resistance or if we want to be part of the establishment. Indeed, my opinion is that we, we, still, the, we, we still are the resistance, but I think that this is uh, interesting in, in the current situation. And, and the third thing, I think that, you know, clusters should be a good instrument for increasing the competitiveness of members. But I think that society is today a must in, on a cluster initiative strategy. And uh, shared value is an interesting approach as I presented uh, previously. But, you know, a greater impact on society, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't think it's something that should be there occasionally, but should be uh, at, at the core of a cluster strategy. Thank you, Joanne. I, I totally agree. I think clusters have been um, really good at dealing with the shock and the and the challenge uh, that we have at the moment, and, uh, and and that I think exemplifies their wider impact in the system. Um, but I don't think we've been as good as we should have at recording what that that it, it is like over over the years. So maybe this will be our prompt to do it better. 
Frederica James, very briefly, have you got any additional one sentences that you want to say? Or are you um, happy that you've you've covered the things you need to? And certainly the Q and A in the chat will be will be shared. Yes, thank you, Madeline. Just um, just a last sentence to say that I know uh, that no one teaches you how to be a, a cluster manager, at least uh, in Italy, uh, uh, until uh, ten years ago. The profession, the job of cluster ma ma manager didn't even exist. Uh, so I know it could be challenging, uh, uh, not just develop strategies, but also uh, identify how to measure the results and how to give evidence of the results. Uh, so I, I know it could be really, really a challenge for cluster managers and cluster organizations. So if we can help in some way and giving them a little support and help based on our research and our exper um, experiences, uh, uh, will be really, really great and we'll be more than happy to do that. So thank you for inviting us and uh, have the opportunity to share our research with all of them. Thank you, Federica. James, did you want to summarize a couple just, of... Just, just one, one phrase, I think, that summarizes, uh, uh, from, from, from my view, a lot of what we've been talking about from Paquita, who's just written that uh, the thought of robustness born of a common language. Uh, and I think that's what we've been trying to achieve for many years in the TCI evaluation group, trying to get to robustness by working out how we uh, develop that common language. I think we've made, we're making some interesting steps and uh, we've still got a way to go, but I think that, that really sums up neatly, I think, where, where we're going. I think that's great. Um, thank, you all, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you all for participating and putting your, um, uh, your Q&As in. Uh, as I say, some of them have been responded to directly and some of them have... Uh, um, uh, uh, we've answered during the session and others I'm sure we'll come back to in the in the discussion. Just to summarize a couple of bits of where we go next with the working group, as ever we don't have enough time to have all the exciting discussions we'd like to have. We'd really have loved to have opened it up to participants um, to come in with their their own experiences and their own um, their own direct questions but um, we just didn't have uh, uh, enough time to do that this afternoon. But um, undoubtedly, we'll have further working group activities um, uh, over the period of time. Um, we are working together on how can we pull together a sort of some guidance and some uh, an, and uh, an evaluation toolkit. I know we started to talk about that in the last uh, TCI conference, so we'll we'll continue to to progress that, try and capture some more of the outputs of what we've been talking about today and at, and at other working group times. Um, we'll continue to participate in the in the conferences whether they be virtual or, or physical um, here's hoping we can have a face-to-face -face at some point in the near future but um, otherwise we'll, we'll continue with the virtual um, and uh, we we'll keep on trying to capture what we're what we're doing through journal articles and other other outputs that we'll share on the TCI website um, so in general, for those who aren't involved in TCI, then normally working groups are, um, are for members only, although we have very, very good participation. So I'd encourage you to explore on the TCI website how you can get more involved um, and uh, uh, um, keep collaborating. Collaborating, As we said, as we, we, we put together in that, that output about what we've been doing since 2013, you actually need a triple helix and all the perspectives you have from practitioners, from policy makers, from the robustness of academic theories to come together and try and co come collectively to actually how can you address this challenge. Um, and so we've been putting into practice how you build a collaboration to look at a collaborative challenge. So keep collaborating and, uh, and keep working together to try and come overcome all sorts of different challenges that we might have. And thank you very much and stay safe everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye See bye. you next Thursday in TCI Oceania. The work continues in TCI. Thank you so bye much. Bye. bye.